looking forward now to the second panel, which I have the honor of moderating. I'm sure you all heard the slogan, it's not television, it's HBO, which became shorthand for shows that have complex narratives, dark characters, and a lot of sex and violence. Um, once upon a time, HBO helped to redefine and revitalize familiar genres, such as crime story, detective story, and western. Celebrated as some of these shows were, um, you, there were very few critics or um, scholars who looked at the ethical and theological dimensions of those same shows. Part of their darkness and complexity, I would suggest, and I'm thinking now of The Sopranos, The Wire, and Deadwood, came from their implicit and explicit grappling with questions such as, what is the nature of evil? What does it mean to be the body of Christ? And, you know, as Tony might say, who the fuck am I? <laughs> um, not to step on anyone's line. <laughs> so I'm happy to um, introduce the panel to you and also our respondent. Then I'm going to take a back seat to everyone until I remind them that they have three or four minutes left. Craig Jeffweiler directs the Real Spirituality Institute at Fuller Seminary's Green Center. Um, he's kind of a double whammy hit here because he recently released the documentary Purple State of Mind, which um, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. He and a friend who um, kind of passed in their religious experiences your college roommate, came back together to talk about red state, blue state, and how they felt about religion and politics. He's also the author of the new book, Into the Dark, Seeing the Sacred in the Top, show, in the top Films of the 21st Century. The 20th? 21st. 21st. Paris Newcomb is a Landon K. Chair for the Peabody Awards at the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Comm at the University of Georgia. He is the author, of, author and editor of numerous books and articles, and um, I, I cited all of them in here for a really long time. So I'm just going to include um, my favorite, television, the critical view, and uh, TV, the most popular art. Adele Reinhardt is a professor in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa in Canada. As I said to Adele earlier, she's lucky not to be an American watching this election. <laughs> Talking about religion and politics. Um, her interests span from the Gospel of John to film criticism. She also has written numerous articles and books, including Jesus of Hollywood and Scripture on the Silver Screen. Um, our respondent is uh, John Caldwell, who's our neighbor at UCLA. He's a Professor of Cinema and Media Studies, and he too is the author of numerous books and articles. Production Culture, and I'm just going to cite two, Production Culture, Industrial Relativity, and Cultural Practice in Film and TV, and the forthcoming Production Studies, Cultural Studies of Film and TV. Um, I'm really glad to turn this over to these folks, and I also want to note, um, they're coming from interdisciplinary perspectives, and so that's both the joy and the challenge of listening and critiquing these papers. So, Craig? <laughs> the Wire. Who watches it? Wire fans? Four people, five people. All right, I got like, my work cut out for them. That's okay. We can do this. <clears throat> the Wire. It was listed in the new book, Stuff People, White People Like. I don't know if you've seen the website. It's a phenomenon that started here in Southern California. It's had millions and millions of hits. It's a comedic satire of the stuff that white people like. I noticed at least five people, white people, like The Wire in this room. Uh, and the author says, though white people have a natural aversion to television, there are some exceptions. For white people to like a TV show, it helps if it is critically acclaimed, low rated, shown on premium cable, and available as a DVD box. He's talking about my life right there. 
The latter is important so that white people can order it from Netflix <laughs> and tell their friends they're really into blank. And I watch 10 episodes in a row in the weekend. I'm almost caught up. Recent series that have fallen in this category include The Sopranos, Six Feet Under, probably Deadwood, and most recently, The Wire. And here's the key phrase. For the past three years, whenever you say The Wire, white people are required to respond by saying, it's the best show on television. <laughs> Why is the best show on television only watched by this small coterie of people? And despite the critics' efforts to kind of berate people into watching this show, it gets the lowest ratings of any ongoing HBO series. They barely got through each season, um, kind of begging for another chance. Please, please let us keep telling our stories. And yet the reviews are just stellar, right? As complex and, and picturesque as one is likely to find this side of Dickens. They say it's the most novelistic program on TV. And when television history is written, little else will rival The Wire. The best show ever broadcast in America. And you haven't seen it. Shame, shame on you white people. <laughs> it's also probably the blackest show that we've ever had in America to some degree. More characters, more panoply of inner city America than any program in network television history. Not five characters, ten characters, about 50 principal black characters on this show. A lot to take in. And Brian Lowry, who's not here, I thought I'd punk him by saying he's not here, uh, but I will give him his quote, which says, a series of such extra extraordinary depth and ambition that perhaps inevitably it's savored only by an appreciative few. So it's sort of appealing to some form of elitism <laughs> um, that it's so great that only a very few can sort of appreciate. It's just a TV show, right? It's just a cop show. What makes this so special? What is this a, a, kind of a separate order? The creator of the show, David Simon, kind of presents it as the anti-cop show. We do what everybody else doesn't do. Our show tells the truth. Everybody else lies. This may be why they haven't gotten a lot of Emmy nominations. <laughs> I don't think that's the way to win friends and influence people who are Emmy voters here in Hollywood. But uh, even in convincing Chris Albrecht, uh, you'll see Chris Albrecht here. Here's David Simon. In a letter he wrote to Chris trying to explain why he should take the show, he said, it would, I argue, be a more profound victory for HBO to take the essence of network fare and smartly turn it on its head so that no one who sees HBO's take on the culture of crime and crime fighting can watch anything like CSI, NYPD Blue, or Law and Order again without knowing that every punch was pulled on. This is the HBO appeal, right? We do what nobody else can do. We tell truths. The network only tells half the truths. It was born out of 9-11, came out of that series, so it's about surveillance society. It's about listening in. This is the first season poster, listen carefully. A chance to kind of spy on others. It follows a team, a team of cops trying to get pieces Build a case. Another subtext. The wire. Perhaps all the pieces matter, right? We can just build a case. We need, we need records. We need phone conversations. We need bank notes. We need photographs. So they stake out their prey. They listen in, looking for clues, trying to piece together the puzzle. The great puzzle solver on the show. Lester Freeman kind of gathers all the evidence and figures out the big picture. Who are they studying? They're studying the boys on the corner. They're studying little, little kids, little punks. They're trying to figure out how can I reach the kingpin by maybe starting with their soldiers. The central metaphor on the show in the uh, third episode of the first season, they sort of talk about the drug war. Um, Sergeant Ellis Carter says, you can't call this war on drugs a war because wars end. And this thing just keeps going on and on and on. So David Simon, a big critic of the war on drugs, says that, that too many people have already been lost in this war that is not working. When are we going to call an end to this strategy that is failing the inner cities? Uh, so it starts with 9-11, but it goes back and says this other war is really an even greater failed war. To understand what a game that David Simon feels we're playing with each other and with these lives. Uh, there's a 
scene where three young drug runners are taught how to play chess. And the two younger ones don't really understand, so he has to explain. This is the kingpin. He's the man. They're like, OK, I understand the kingpin. And one of them says, well, where are we? Who are we? He says, these are the pawns. They're like soldiers. They're out of the game early. And indeed, those three young men don't make it through the series. End up shooting each other. Pawns in the game. So my chapter in the book is entitled Playing the Game. David Simon sees what he does as Greek drama rather than Shakespearean TV. He says most TV is Shakespearean, right? Kind of good people wrestling with moral issues, kind of overcoming, triumphing, tying things up in a little neat bow at the end of 44 minutes. He's doing Greek tragedy. Nobody gets out. Nobody escapes. We're all just pawns in this larger game. Our hero that we follow, Jimmy McNulty, Irish Catholic cop, big drinker, lives hard, plays hard. His partner, oh nice, I don't need that. Uh, his partner, Bunk, uh, they take on, in the first season, they take on the Barksdale gang, kind of people who run West Baltimore. Second season shifts to Longshoremen and looks at Baltimore from that side, people who are losing jobs. Uh, what about security? Are we are our ports secure? What's going in and out through the ports? Deals with uh, Irish or Polish Catholics and their families. Third season goes back to the drug trade. We follow Stringer Bell. Is there going to be a new kingpin on the streets? It's about reform. What's the possibility of reform? You get a uh, a mayor, a young aspiring mayor, who says, "I will change Baltimore. I'll clean it up." Will the cops go along with the mayor? Is there too much corruption there? How do you root out crime in a fallen system, in a broken system? One cop takes it upon himself and says, the war on drugs is a failure. It's a sham. I'm going to deregulate the area and say, if you want to do drugs, fine. Just do it in this few block area. We'll call it not Amsterdam, but Amsterdam. And we're not going to mess with you at this point. We'll look the other way in our war on drugs. Fourth season takes on education. Takes you inside schools, follows the lives of four young students, and a new kingpin arrives as the others fall and go to jail. Proposition Joe unites East Baltimore and West Baltimore as the supplier. And the fifth season deals with something near and dear to Diane's heart. It deals with journalism and whether uh, this war on drugs is being reported with uh, authenticity. Are we caring about the inner city? Who's telling the stories? Why does David Simon care? Because he was a member of the press. Didn't have much air then either. Uh, tough uh, investment in inner city and reporting local news. He's worried about the fourth estate. Are they doing their job? Are we allowing them to tell the stories that need to be told? His partner in the show, uh, Ed Burns, was a cop. 20, 30 years on the streets. And after he was a cop, he became a school teacher. So you, now you see all the pieces. We're studying. You know, City Hall, we're studying the police, we're studying the uh, uh, education system, we're studying journalism. What makes the show work is the characters. Characters you haven't really seen or heard before. Omar, uh, a Haitian, uh, a gay Haitian man who is kind of a Robin Hood of the streets. He steals from the rich drug dealers as a, a way to kind of give back to his community. You have people like Bubbles. Homeless addict pushing his cart through the streets of West Baltimore. Will he escape? Will anybody escape? You have uh, people like Kima, uh, African American, Korean American, uh, lesbian member of the police force for private life or public life. How does that all intersect? A woman in a man's world. You have killers like Snoop, a young woman you wouldn't even know was a woman because she has dressed herself up to be so tough to manage this. World. I looked in the chapter at two aspects of Baltimore's religious life. The chapter is about lived religion. Uh, Commander Irwin Irvin Burrell says it's Baltimore, gentlemen. The gods will not save you. You've got to get used to it. There's Catholic Baltimore, white Baltimore, embodied by Jimmy McNulty. People like uh, Prezbaluski, Polish Catholic. 
Parquet, Italian Catholic. Baltimore, the most Catholic city in America to some degree. The first cathedral in America was in Baltimore. Maryland, right, a Catholic state. Prime attention to the lived religion of the community. The season two all turns on the longshoremen who are having a fight with the local police. They're fighting over who's going to buy a stained glass window. Who's going to get the window dedicated by their union in the church? And so a religious fight becomes a fight in the streets. And the police take on the longshoremen because they're mad about whose donation is going to be accepted first in the local church. In the black community, it's not Catholic faith. It's more of a storefront faith. It's, it's Baptist churches. It's AME churches. And Bubbles introduces himself at the AA meeting in the church basement as God's own drug addict. There in the church basement, he uh, is given a chance for a new life. His sponsor chases him season after season, rescuing over and over and over again. By the uh, end of the series, he's starting to clean up. But will it last? Will it stick? Will his new life that he's found really um, continue? Omar and his religious faith is the crux of season three. He ends up in a battle against the Barksdale gang because the Barksdale gang assault his mother, shoot at him on a Sunday. He says, now that is breaking the gangster law, right? We all know that you don't shoot each other on Sunday. Shooting at my grandma in her chapeau, in her church lady hat, that is beyond the pale. And so he declares war on the gang. The gang brings in Brother Muzon, a Muslim, dressed sort of like Malcolm X. And he, in a sense, takes Malcolm X and uh, the by any means necessary uh, philosophy to a very, very violent level. And so they face off in the streets, killer on killer, who will win? I'll let you decide for yourselves. And one, maybe the greatest moment of hope in that season three of reform, Cuddy, a, uh, a guy who's been in jail, gets out on the street. How's he rebuild his life? Is reform possible? He turns to the church for help, and the deacon ushers him in, sort of says, we can get you started. You want to start your own business? We can help you. You want to create a gym for young people? We'll front you the money. And so he's able to be lifted up. The deacon is played by Melvin Williams, who was the most notorious drug dealer in Baltimore in real life during the 70s and 80s. It's really Melvin Williams' story that is behind the entire show. Uh, the drug dealer on the show is based on Melvin Williams' life. Why do they know so much about Melvin Williams? Who busted Melvin Williams? Ed Burns the co-creator of the series. They're telling their own story, the Baltimore story. In conclusion. <laughs> uh, why do I care? Why do I care? Why does this show speak to me so much? Young people. I was uh, a youth minister. I worked with Young Life in inner city Charlotte in my hometown. Um, I tried to get young people like this uh, out of their situation. Help them try to get them out of the game. And uh, to watch them start as innocent young men and end up hardened, broken, imprisoned, absolutely broke my heart. This series will get inside you. Um, it will haunt you in enduring ways. The story of Michael will get to you. I know kids like Michael. I've endured people like Michael. He goes from a kid of great promise to a kid who is slipping away. Um, I won't give away the ending. <laughs> David Simon came and talked to us. Diane hosted in this spring. It was a powerful discussion of journalism. We can talk about that after. Is it an essential Jeremiah? Is it okay for three white guys to be talking about the problems of, of black inner city Baltimore? Or is it some form of enlightened racism? Maybe we don't watch the show because we think, um, you know, it's, it's an unsolvable problem. It's a show so dark and so depressing that you don't even try. Final quote. The true achievement of The Wire is its understated indictment of the larger game that occurs off screen. As Anthony Walton says, as much as I enjoy crime and drama, I'm wary of shows that use urban suffering as a form for entertainment. I constantly search for the escape, the letting off the hook that these shows leave the upper middle class audience. That's network TV. 
the ritual purgation that allows the audience, myself included, to go on with their lives while the poor and African American body count continues to improve in real projects. I love The Wire because it disturbs my peace. It puts me on the hook. It makes me think about what the, game, the games that I'm playing. It makes me care about the lives that I've forgotten, even in my hometown of Charlotte, North Carolina. lived in West Baltimore for six years, <clears throat> and uh, watching it become this is, uh, is really a different kind of thing. The Wire is a truly, truly great show, and has received a Peabody Award, despite the fact that it has never received an Emmy, uh, as have uh, both Deadwood and The Sopranos. Um, I want to talk about Deadwood today. I, I should begin, by the way, with a confession. Uh, I have watched multiple episodes of almost every show that we've talked about. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think with, with Deadwood, most people would not think of it immediately as a topic for the study of religion and the embodiment of religion, because of largely because of the language of the show. Uh, it was an incredibly foul, obscene, profane bit of language. Some people simply couldn't watch it because of that. Um, second impressions, I think, deal with the language and note the depth and the creative expansion of that language. And I think that Deadwood takes on decided religious undertones in spite of all of these things. And for one thing, the series, more than many others, is formed from a deeply personal engagement and statement about what the show is dealing with. Now, like everybody else, I've been trained to avoid the intentional fallacy. It's not, we, we don't take for granted what creators say. Uh, certainly, we had a great example of that the other night, uh, with people fumbling uh, as producers and writers trying to figure out how to respond to these things. But I think there's something different about David Milch. And you'll note that all of these shows uh, are created by people who have very, very strong personal power in the industry and very strong personal visions. Um, and Milch has written a great deal about Deadwood. And he wrote most of it after the show was over as a, in a book that he did as a companion piece. And I draw a good many quotes from that book because I think unlike some producer writers, uh, he is very thoughtful about this. And someone who trained with Robert Penn Warren and R.W.B. Lewis and and, uh, and uh, Harold Bloom, I think he knows what he's talking about when he talks about the way the piece was created. Now, I think it's also possible to do, and I think we've demonstrated this, it, we, we can take any show on television and find religious thematics. We can do anything that we do with ideology or with gender, we can do with religion. So there's nothing surprising about the fact that we're doing this with popular television programs. But still, I think there's something about the Deadwood that makes it distinctive even in this discussion. Much of it comes from the language, again, on the appropriate side, from Milch's elegant adoption of rhythms and patterns we recognize from other sources. In the essay that I contributed to the collection, it brings me to the way I described it with reference to the strong language that he uses. And I'm quoting that the essay now. Admiration for the language of Deadwood, as extensive as the appropriation approbation, recognizes that even such socially censured words may be woven into poetry. As presented by this outstanding cast, the language is most often described as Shakespearean. And it is indeed important to note that the language is performed, not merely spoken. As an author in this sense, Milch's function, perhaps more so than with many other creators and executive producer head writers, is somewhat transcendent in the most theological significance of that term significance of that term. Deadwood may be solidly based in factual history, but it's fully realized, created from Milch's vision. As much as it, as it is Shakespearean, then, the language of Deadwood also draws on the other great text of the period, the 1611 authorized edition of the Bible, the King James Version. That language is biblical throughout Deadwood. Moreover, the language draws on yet another great model that matches as well some of the central characters in Deadwood. This world is populated with beings already fallen from paradise, and in this sense, the language is Miltonic as much as it is Shakespearean. 
Now, clearly, as I've already indicated, the question of authorship in television is a very vexed problem, and there's no need here to wander into issues that bother scholars, studios, the Writers Guild of America, our groups of men and women, young and old, who spend mornings taking the sun at the farmer's market. There is, however, more to the religious underpinnings of Deadwood than the language itself. There is the vision I mentioned earlier. When Milch approached HBO, and he's written a great deal about the genesis of the show, he went to them with this pitch, St. Paul gets collared. As he put it, I originally proposed to HBO to do a series about city cops in Rome in the time of Nero. Nero was crazy, and it interested me to think about what it would be like to be a cop an instrument of order in a world that could invoke no ordering principle. Besides, do what this insane person tells you to do. Nero would be walking down the street, he'd say that man would be better with his tongue cut out and his hands hung around his neck and the cops would have to do it. I wanted to imagine what it was like for the cop and then for the cops to encounter a new organizing principle, which was faith. In the first episode, the head cop was going to be told to arrest St. Paul. And here again is another quote that he, where he talks about the, the series. The series was to be, quote, about the lives of city cops in ancient Rome during Nero's reign before a system of justice had been codified. I was interested in how people improvised the structures of a society when there was no law to guide them. How the law developed out of the social impulse to minimize the collateral damage of the taking of revenge. Now, because HBO was doing Rome then, he was asked to think about another place to do it, and he proposed doing it on the frontier, and there's hardly a better place to think about a disordered world than the American frontier in the last quarter of the 19th century. So there's one other quote I want to use here, which also has theological overtones. I, I settled on a story about Deadwood because the camp came together in the mid-1870s deep into the Industrial Revolution, and yet it was an enact, a reenactment of the story of the founding of America, and a reenactment, too, of the story of original sin. I suppose I accept Hawthorne's definition of original sin as the violation of the sanctity of another's heart. Now, I won't bother myself here as thinking there may be a touch of the original in, in that kind of pride about what you're doing, but I think the key lies in the concerns with how the law developed out of that social impulse to minimize the collateral damage of the taking of revenge or the concern with the sanctity of the human heart. Because as it turns out, every character in Deadwood is in some degree motivated by revenge and is involved with that. And here the story, everyone is capable of inflicting collateral damage on everyone else. Now this suggests a relationship between the various religious motifs in Deadwood and something like civil religion as we found in most of the other shows. The sense that an entire culture can be grounded in assumptions either rooted in or displacing overtly theological matters. And certainly in choosing the frontier at this particular moment, Milch has something of that in mind. Deadwood is set in a territory stolen from Native Americans in the year of Custer's defeat, the year that was also the centennial of the Declaration of Independence, and that event was being celebrated at a huge centennial exhibition in Philadelphia. At the same time, this was the centennial ex exhibition where Henry Adams first examined the machines of new electrical power and envisioned a new America. If you remember the education of Henry Adams, he talks about being at the, ex at the exhibition uh, there. Custer's defeat had simply been a few weeks before, and word got through by telegraph. All those two things going together always amaze me. And here's one of Milch's comments that could stand as a definition of civil religion. My feeling about Deadwood is it's a single organism, and I think human society is the body of God. And in a lot of ways, it's about the different parts of the body having a somewhat more confident sense of their identity over the course of time. And that struggle for identity lies at the heart of Deadwood as well. The, the, there are people who are overtly religious in Deadwood. The town's minister is a, a, an amazing character. Uh, and he, he at, the, at the funeral service for Wild Bill Hickok, who was killed in Deadwood, he goes through uh, a, a long quote from Paul and, uh, and tells us it's one spirit, we all belong to the one body, the familiar passage, and then ends his, his comment by saying, I believe in God's purpose not knowing it. I ask him moving in me to allow me to see his will. 
I ask him moving in others to allow them to see it. Let us now sing how firm a foundation is Mr. Hickok is laid to rest. Uh, now Smith, the minister, later develops a brain tumor and the doctor, the town doctor there, treats him, but the doctor is an interesting character in himself and he tries to help the man, he can't, and so Smith is euthanized by, uh, by Al Swearingen, the dark saint at the core of this. But when the doctor goes back to his office where he also lives, he, he, he falls to his knees and, and prays. And he's speaking to God here. If I was a more adaptable primate or one of your regular practitioners, I suspect I wouldn't feel this pain, talking about his knees. I guess I'd have a wad of cartilage covering the patella, protecting me from this discomfort. This, this Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, please God, take that minister, the man is suffering. What conceivable godly use is his protracted suffering to you? What conceivable godly use? What conceivable godly use was the screaming of all those men? Did you, did, you, did you need to hear their death agonies to know your omnipotence? Mama, find my arm. Mommy, 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 they shot my leg off. It hurts so bad, it hurts so bad. And he concludes his prayer, admitting my understanding's imperfection, trusting that you have a purpose, praying that you consider it served, I beg your, you to relent, thy will be done, amen. He's talking about this time as a field doctor in the Civil War. Now, the, the need for finding some purpose is there, and the teleological per impulse, the hope for a visible, knowable, well-planned purpose doesn't go very far in Deadwood. But that's a clue to the eschatology of the series, I think. I've suggested in another essay long years ago that one of the great achievements of television fictions is that they don't need to end. The power of soap opera, the telenovela, of all the serial narratives we're talking about is in some ways the power of hope that things will turn out well in the end. We wait for that end, it never comes, and if it does come in a television series, it's usually a crummy ending because they don't know how to end things. So it's the open-ended series that is, in fact, the defining characteristic of television. Uh, and I think it's also the larger purpose and the larger sense of theology that's in these, in these television shows. So I want to end now with a quote from Milch again. Because the show was supposed to go on for two more years, HBO said, no, you, you can't do it. And then he said he's going to do two uh, two-hour movies. They wind it up, and it, 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 they canceled those possibilities. So that it literally stops in the middle of this horrific sense. And in the paper, I talk about the key characters who embody all sorts of different aspects of, of the struggle for finding some meaning, some purpose, which never comes. And Milch, in writing about the show, says this, because it comes back to not only civil religion, but it certainly comes back to where we are politically today. None of us want to realize that we live in Deadwood, but all of us do. That's the point of the exercise. After first recoiling in horror, we come to love the place where we live in all its contradictions. To love not just America, but the world of which America is simply the most recent form of organization. American materialism, in all its crassness and extravagance, is simply an expression of the fact that we have organized ourselves according to a more energizing principle than any civilization that came before us. I guess I'd paraphrase Jefferson that with all its horrors, Deadwood is the last best chance of all human cocksuckers. <laughs> Papers called uh, Where Am I? Where Am I Going? The Sopranos on Life, Death, and Religion. And to continue the confessional, I haven't watched a lot of TV, but I've watched every one of these 86 uh, episodes, uh, some of them uh, many times. For 86 episodes spanning six seasons, Anthony Soprano allowed us into his world, his family, and his mind. We drove with him from New York to North Caldwell, New Jersey followed him into bed with his wife and his gumas, and eavesdropped on his psychotherapy sessions. We watched as he whacked those who stood in his way and protect himself and his family from being whacked in turn. During the last few moments of the final episode, we waited with Tony in Holston's restaurant for his family, meanwhile scanning the room for potential danger, leafing through the menu and selecting a song on the tabletop jukebox. And then, 
The camera cut to black, and a few seconds later, the final credits began to roll. Life with Tony was over. In the aftermath, the question on every viewer's mind was, what happened to Tony? The real question was, however, what happened to us? And now what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is argue that over the course of these 86 episodes, viewers took a wild journey through the mental and emotional landscape of a fat fucking crook from New Jersey. As we hung on for dear life, we encountered most, if not all, of the big issues of our time. Morality and violence, homosexuality and racism, popular culture, and the changing American family. Midst all this, we also reflected on the fundamental existential questions. Who are we and where are we going? The constant awareness of impending doom is what gives The Sopranos its edge. In season six, Tony's wife Carmela confines, I worry, Tony, I do. You already got shot. Now you won't even go down and get the paper. Who's out there? What is it? What are the million other possibilities? The FBI waiting to take you away? You eat and you play, you pretend that there's not a giant piano hanging by a rope, just over the top of your head every minute of every day. Most of us do not fear a knock on the door, but we too live in the shadow of a giant piano. As human beings, we must accept what Tony's psychiatrist, Dr. Jennifer Melfi, refers to as the mystery of God, or whatever you want to call it, the questionable gift of knowing that we're going to die. The awareness of death not only affects the mood and tone of the series, but also opens the way for exploring the nature of human existence itself. In the first episode of season six, Tony is shot in the stomach by his clinically paranoid Uncle Junior. Shocking as this is, the event is not without irony. Tony certainly accepts the risk of being shot in the line of duty. As he tells Dr. Melfi, we're in a situation where everybody involved knows the stakes. But this gunshot catches him in a rare, selfless moment, caring for his uncle and cooking him dinner. Because this is the first episode of an entire series, we really don't expect Tony to die. Yet matters are touch and go. As, episode, as the second episode in the series opens, Tony is lying in a coma close to death. If his body is still, however, his brain is in overdrive. Throughout episodes two and three of season six, Tony has a lengthy coma dream in which he is at a hotel in Costa Mesa, California. Somehow, we never find out how, he loses his own wallet and briefcase and finds that instead he's carrying the briefcase of a man named Kevin Finnerty. This discovery causes him significant distress. My whole life was in that briefcase, he says, to say nothing of inconvenience. The switch also prods some existential angst. Where, uh, who am I? Where am I going? In real life, Tony has narrowed down the alternatives to two. My estimate historically, 80% of us end up in the can like, like Johnny Sack, or the embalming table at Cazarelli's. This is Tony to his brother-in-law, Bobby. But the question, where am I going, pertains not only or even primarily to his life in the present, but more pointedly to his post-mortem destiny. Most important, at least to Tony, is the connection between the two questions. Does who he is, that is, how he lives his life now, determine where he's going when he dies? Within the framework of Italian-American Catholic identity, the answer to this question is obvious. Tony is a sinner who breaks just about all of the Ten Commandments on a regular basis, and he's going straight to hell. But nothing is straightforward in this series, which offers us not one, but several, often contradictory answers to the existential questions that Tony poses in his coma dream. Representatives of Catholicism, Evangelical Christianity, Buddhism, and Judaism all offer their take on the ultimate questions, and uh, these are explored in the paper, in the chapter itself. Most appealing to Tony is the explanation offered by a fellow hospital patient when he's recovering from his uh, gunshot wound, a man named John Schwinn. The fact is, nothing is separate. Everything is connected. The universe is just a big soup of molecules bumping against one another. The shapes we see are only in our own consciousness. It's not surprising that Tony is attracted to Schwinn's explanations, and he builds them into his own repertoire. If there is no heaven and hell, and no duality between good and evil, 
then even a crook like Tony may be off the hook. Schlin has helped Tony to articulate the inchoate impressions and feelings that remained with him from his coma dream, in which, as he told the scientist, I felt like I was being pulled towards something and I don't want to go back. The climax of the coma dream takes place at the very moment that the real Tony, lying comatose in the ICU, suddenly slides into extreme tachycardia, extraordinarily rapid beating of the heart. In the dream, Tony, also known again in the dream as Kevin Finnerty, finds himself driving towards a big and brightly lit country estate. From inside, he can hear many voices. His cousin, who does not recognize him, urges him to enter, but he insists that Tony, or Kevin, must first relinquish his briefcase, and there ensues a tussle over the briefcase itself. Though he is attracted to the house, Tony is hesitant. As he takes a step forward, he hears a childish voice calling out to him, Daddy, don't go, Daddy. We love you, Daddy. Don't leave us. And this is the voice of Meadow, his daughter Meadow, uh, from her childhood. Ultimately, it is his daughter Meadow's love that calls Tony back from the brink of dissolution. And initially, it seems that Tony's awakening has triggered a spiritual rebirth as he has been resurrected from the dead. He's also resurrected in a, in a moral sense. As he says to his sister Janice, I'm supposed to be dead. Now I'm alive. I'm the luckiest guy in the whole world. So after this, from now on, every day is a gift. Tony's sense of rebirth initially seems to promise moral generation as well. He even seems poised to set aside his bitter rivalry with Phil Leotardo, assuring him of his goodwill as they work out a business arrangement. There's enough garbage for everybody, Tony says. As the final season spirals downward to its abrupt conclusion, however, Tony gradually reverts to form. Indeed, to an even more brutal and unfeeling version of his former self, as his cold-blooded murder of his nephew and protege, Christopher, attests. And despite his sworn intentions and his gratitude to Carmela for her steadfast care and love throughout his illness, he cannot, in the end, keep away from other women. As he tells Dr. Melfi in, uh, in episode 9, every day is a gift, but does it have to be a pair of socks? Where does this spiritual and moral reversion, or perhaps even regression, leave Tony? Perhaps everything has changed, or perhaps nothing. We can, however, point to three elements which persist as the foundation of Tony's stance towards the existential questions that troubled him in the coma and in its wake. The first is the absence or irrelevance of God. Tony's Catholicism by no means shapes his view of who he is and where he's going. The second is that the absence of God, and therefore the absence of judgment, heaven and hell notwithstanding, this is not all there is. Death may be absolute, but somewhere, somehow, there is another dimension of existence. And the third, perhaps intention, at least with the second, perhaps also the first, is the absolute value attached to being here. For Tony, here is all that counts. And as I watched and rewatched the episodes of season six, it was that word here that really jumped out at me. As he comes to life from the hospital, his eyes squinting in the bright light like a newborn baby, Meadow exclaims, Dad, look, here you are. Later, while recuperating at home, he expresses his love and appreciation for Carmela. Hey, Blondie, it's all you, you know, the reason I'm back here. It is not only here, that is, with Tony's return to New Jersey in the bosom of his family, that we find an emphasis on the spatial, this-worldly element. In the very first scene of season six, Carmela dreams that she was with Adriana, uh, their nephew Christopher's fiance in the unfinished spec house that Carmela and her father are building. Adriana looks around the house and then asks, who's going to live here? In the context of Carm's dream, Adriana is simply wondering who will occupy the large but shoddily built house when it is finished. But there's another level of meaning, for Adriana is dead, a fact that the viewers know, but Carmela does not, though she has her suspicions. 
In this context, her, her question has a broader and more existential meaning. She, Adriana, is no longer among the, those who live here, but who will be. We are left with the same question by the end of the same episode, which leaves Tony Soprano bleeding on the floor of Junior's house. And if Tony does survive physically, is his stance in the world such that he is really alive? Or is he truly, as the Hasidic elder Mr. Teitelman explains in season one, a golem, a Frankenstein, a monster who is already dead, even as he continues to walk, talk, eat, and breathe? So what has happened to Tony? Nothing. Who is he? The same New Jersey crook he was before, the one with the giant piano hanging overhead. He eats, watches TV, manages his crew, enjoys his guma, fights with his wife, frets about his children, and does the same drive from New York to New Jersey that we Sopranos fanatics have come to know so well. Where is he going? Nowhere at all, unless we count Miami and Vegas which in this series are basically the same as New Jersey, but sunnier. What about us, who have traveled with Tony through the landscape of New Jersey and the dream world in his head? And what about our early 21st century society in which The Sopranos, with its violence, cursing, irony, and humor, can flourish? The Directors Guild of America concluded that HBO's The Sopranos has quite literally reshaped television. Maureen Ryan dubbed The Sopranos the most influential television drama ever. I guess they say this about all the shows. <laughs> In the New York Times, Alessandra Stanley declared that the decline and fall of The Sopranos, Tony, his wife Carmela, and the rest, served as a parable of America in decline. So perhaps our study of Tony's existential angst can tell us the following, that America whether that includes Canada or not, you know, we can debate that. Uh, that America is an existential crisis. That faith and ethics have fallen by the wayside, not only in practice, but in theory as well. That we ignore death at the same time as we are obsessively anxious about it. That God is a delusion. Certainly there are those who would say all of the above about themselves and American society in the present century. The high caliber of this series is beyond question. Nevertheless, as George Anastasia reminds us, this is television. And I comment, let's not get carried away. Whatever else it might be, The Sopranos is a cautionary tale about the boundaries between the visual media and real life. Tony, his son, and his associates watch endless hours of television. Uh, you know, the image of Tony sitting there with the uh, package of ice cream on his belly, you know, watching TV, watching the History Channel. When Carmela is outraged at how much the protagonist of Christopher's film Cleaver looks like Tony, her husband admonishes her, it's a movie, it's fiction. The series does acknowledge that we tend to see our lives in terms of television and film. Nevertheless, things go terribly wrong as soon as characters blur the lines between entertainment and real life. Soon, Tony himself becomes convinced that Christopher modeled Cleaver's slovenly and violent main character after him. When Tony's son, AJ, wants to avenge his father by killing Junior, just as Michael Corleone did in The Godfather, Tony admonishes him tenderly, Jesus Christ, AJ, you make me want to cry. It's a movie. In the final analysis, the life lessons that Tony would have us learn can best be summed up by the poem that Meadow reads aloud while her father is in the coma. The poem is called Pater Noster, Our Father, by the French poet Jacques Prévert. Our Father, who art in heaven, stay there, and we shall stay on earth, which is sometimes so pretty. Or, in Tony's own words, I'm not saying there's nothing out there, Polly, but to not live your life, what the fuck are you going to do? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and hearing these papers, actually the longer versions were the ones that I've read, uh, I've titled my response, Finding God at HBO. For starters, I, I want to point out some shared general concerns of the papers, uh, and then I'd like to step back and raise some broader issues about the, this panel and this project. 
All three papers make thoughtful, articulate, convincing theological reflections on HBO's prestige cinematic programming. All three bracket off the text and mostly give themselves over to the story worlds as parables, allegories, or philosophical illustrations. At the same time, they largely look past institutional issues, uh, social or cultural dim dimensions of HBO viewing, HBO production, or HBO programming. Even though these things, for these series and others, might also be enmeshed with metaphysical dimensions and implications. There certainly is a long and ancient tradition to this sort of text-based analysis in both theology and philosophy. Yet the text as story tradition in play here has also been regularly displaced in recent academic film and television studies. In the history of religion, however, story texts are very, very much matter, on their own, something to mine as charged cryptic codes for keys to life, God, and existence, a project that takes considerable effort and care. I also think it no accident that all three of these series can be seen as auteurist or signature shows as well, since in a theological sense, authorship cannot be easily separated from the authority of the one telling the story. These papers grapple with the authority of the maker to understand the messages encrypted in HBO's holy texts. All three shows uh, uh, show that the critics' game is about interpretation of the allegory and not about the messenger delivering the allegory. After reading these papers, I realized that they might be usefully placed within three broad subfields, ethics, eschatology, and ontology, respectively. Craig's paper on The Wire made the ethical questions of lived religion and the prophetic mode chief concerns. His analysis, analysis wasn't just about the social histories of Baltimore. It was also a study of moral standards and how they affect conduct both on and off the screen. Craig's paper churned up the fundamental question, how shall we then live? Horace's paper on Deadwood clearly fits instead within an eschatological tradition, as he himself suggests since it repeatedly implicates religious doctrines concerning the human soul and its relationship to death, judgment, heaven, and hell. It's hard to imagine using Swearingen's behavior as a moral compass or ethical roadmap for anything in real life. But positioning the series as, as an ubermyth and a genesis allegory, both for humanity and for the nation, Horace's analysis circled around the question, where do we come from? Adele's paper on The Sopranos was less concerned with either the moral or ethical dimension of the Sopranos story world, as in Craig's account, or with connections between the story world and explicit theological ideas intended by the series author-producer, as in Horace's analysis. Instead, it was about the existential predicament and ontological questioning by characters within the fiction. Taking a cue from Tony, Adele underscored the primary ontological question who am I and where am I going? But didn't offer these answers to those questions like Horace's showrunner, Milch. In my mind, the three papers, not just the series story worlds, also represent a continuum between grounding on the one side and transcendence on the other. Craig's paper opened with a very personal disclosure and situated the wire in both his life and in the specific material and social histories of Charlotte, North Carolina and Baltimore. Horace navigated many of the existential concerns of Adele, but returned to the public person of Mills to crack open the complex code of Deadwood's story world. Adele provided a nuanced reflection on how the dark world of Tony Soprano churned up fundamental philosophical questions about fate, determinism, free will, good versus evil, etc. But resolved them at the very end by placing them in the context of the very open-ended and transcendent view of French poet Prévert. Unlike Horace's fate-driven Deadwood characters, which grind their way to their dismal allegorical ends, Adele's Tony at least gets to have epiphanies and self-consciousness and a therapist, even if he will inevitably get whacked. All three papers dealt with visceral, violent, bodily dark, and very fallen worlds. All three series deploy fatalism with key metaphors. The piano constantly hanging over Tony's head that Adele cites in The Sopranos and Valchek's van lost forever at sea like a rock around the neck and dragging him down in Craig's longer paper about the wire are metaphors that just as easily apply to Horace's Deadwood inhabitants. 
None of these papers offer solutions, all raise questions and underscore at some point in their pages a common theme, the almost mystical connectedness of all humanity. These papers in these series also raise a number of complementary questions that weren't asked but might be. Why do we as scholars and critics go to elite, higher culture, premium channels like HBO that fewer people watch to find and locate God, rather than to low culture religious broadcasting talk shows where God ostensibly addresses and speaks directly to viewers in second person? Aren't the character hosts on religious TV, after all, more like the prophets than, as Craig shows, David Simon is on The Wire? After all, they speak directly to viewers about the meaning of life, the, life, the consequences of sin, the viewer's sin, not Swearingen's sin, and the end times. Why are we, as scholars, so invested in HBO but not TBN? What is the logic of having to work so hard to decrypt and unpack the complex messages of The Wire, Sopranos, and Deadwood? Because does God take this much work and critical discipline, and of course, schooling? For someone to see that a rape or a decapitation is not a rape or a decapitation, but rather an important form of moral guidance or spiritual reflection. What would happen if instead of looking at Simon Milton and the other signature showrunners as the authors, we looked at HBO as the parable teller? What does having a messenger like this, who enlightens and connects us with grace and humanity's oneness, say about ourselves? One comment in particular tweaked my curiosity about these alternative possibilities. Craig makes a very convincing point that The Wire makes a, quote, blistering critique of unchecked capitalism, unquote. I agree. But does this mean that the HBO Time Warner conglomerate is making a blistering critique of its own out-of-control capitalism, which is arguably the very definition of corporate media conglomeration? How, therefore, can this type of on-screen critique arguably uh, in the other series as well have any, any teeth. Could the same kind of contradiction undercut not just the political bite, but also the metaphysical preoccupations of HBO's prestige programming as well? Uh, this question made me consider how HBO's uh, prestige uh, programming may be analogous to the Shakespeare industry. After all, this literary industry never seems to die. Folks with vested interest each generation, including English departments and the middle culture capitalists in Hollywood, constantly prop it up as high culture, uh, and uh, it ignores or erases the bard's low culture origins in the 17th century and his mixed cultural manifestations in the 19th century. Like the Shakespeare industry, should we talk about the premium cable cultural industry, which constantly pushes certain kinds of narrative experience up the cultural caste system to higher and more exclusive cultural niches? where a certain kind of engaged reflection and distinctive media consumption can simultaneously and profitably occur. And some final thoughts. One trait shared by all three papers was the sense that we get to watch these series, their stories and their characters from an Olympian point of view. Numerous references are made in the longer papers to Greek tragedies, not just to Shakespeare. These are ugly, fallen worlds, but arguably not the worlds of the affluent that pay for and consume HBO. It dawned on me that perhaps this very staged cultural elevation and constructed elitism is exactly why these three series and others like them work so well on HBO. All positioned, to use a shop-worn term, the spectator in a place of omniscience and omnipresence, scanning down from the mountaintop to observe, judge, and pity the poor tragic mortals and the sprawling epics and multiple plot lines below. The terms are different, but now we may pay the tithes, alms, and indulgences not to get into the temple to worship, but to clear the decks in our harried affluent lives to view serious, explicit, boundary-pushing morality plays on our widescreen TVs and home theaters. I would never go as far to say that watching premium cable or their DVDs is a religious experience, but doing so clearly bears affinities with the rituals, conventions, and focused personal reflections long associated with lived and organized religion. In the complementary scheme that I am considering here with HBO as God's messenger, one would of course not expect God to be explicitly represented or embodied among the poor, tragic denizens of Deadwood or East Baltimore. This is because we, as HBO viewers, have been given the deity's vantage point in the narrative text as part of our purchase. 
And this vantage point is not cluttered up by constant commercial breaks, promos, and interstitials, you know, the ugly contemporary flack that corresponds to the visceral fallen worlds on screen, including the mud and blood splattered clothing of the Deadwood folk. HBO, it's not television, it's God thinking. Now there's a value added branding strategy supported by narrative theory, uh, nonetheless. In closing, I do get what these papers have argued today, and they've made me want to get and watch the complete box DVD sets of all three series. Good marketing, right? Which I wouldn't have done otherwise. But they've also made me scratch my head about where we look for morality tales and transcendental meanings. What does looking for those allegories, transcendent, uh, transcendent reflections, and metaphysical meanings in these specific places and in this conglomerate say, not about Tony or Valchek or Simon or Milch, but about us. kind of the feeling I get when I get sucked into these worlds and then begin to wonder what in the heck is going on in this room I'm in and where I'm at and who am I. And this came up in, in Craig's paper earlier about the white folk that watch, you know, uh, The Wire, right? I mean, it, it's, it's loaded in terms of, of those sorts of issues. So um, I, I like that part of it. And, and I can't say that I am a devoted fan of any of these three shows, I haven't watched as many episodes as anybody on this uh, panel has. And so uh, these were kind of, this was a sense I was getting from this. And, and I do think by placing the wire in this kind of, this ethical category rather than this eschatological or ontological category where you move up to a more abstract level, you are dealing with the question about how we then should live. So I was making some generalization that probably don't uh, hold entirely in all these shows. But there is a kind of continuum of, of concerns here. And, and the fact that you would feel more displaced by that it makes absolute sense to me compared to Deadwood, where it is set in the past. It is a myth. It's mythological. 
it's got all the trappings and we're willing to fall into it and, and approach it that way. So I get what you're saying I, and I like your suggestion. I also would add, and this is purely pragmatic, left to their own devices, um, every one of these um, essayists might have decided to write about um, anything from the shopping network to, you know, Oprah. It was the editorial decision of the book at this point to focus narrowly on, on melodrama and dramatic television series. So it's also a constraint of the framing of the book that forces us, in a sense, right. to shows like HBO. Well, that, that comment makes, this is great. At this conference, I can make a confession then, because I do the same thing. <laughs> that, these are the shows that I teach. I, I love to, to look at and try to understand uh, complicated television and stylistically interesting television and all these things. So, you know, I talk a big game, but the fact is, <laughs> I'm, I'm part of the canonizers just like everybody else in terms of the way I teach. So, in, in many ways, these questions are directed at myself, too. I don't teach TV, mm -hmm. but I'm going to teach these shows now based on these <laughs> thoughts, right? <laughs> but I should probably, you know, try to figure TV out. So. Um, Vince? Yeah, the issues that John addresses here, I think, bring us back to a little bit of discussion we had with the last panel, and that little bit that many academics face in television that somewhat perhaps delighted these papers as enjoyable as the practices that were, I think, political, economic, problematic, and something delighted here. I think it's a good point to bring it up. Now, I, I have some of a uh, problem, perhaps, with uh, at least one of the shows that I'm least familiar with, that's Deadwood, maybe you can correct me on this, but your interpretation of the narrative itself, um, I found perhaps a little hagiographic. If I'm interpreting correctly the notion you brought up about original sin, a very fraught term in American society as a political uh, and socioeconomic uh, implications beyond the religious ones. I wonder if those are addressed. I mean, people uh, describe it more from Milch's standpoint, and perhaps from yours as well, having a more personal and existential uh, relationship, whereas historically, politically, American. It's regarded as related very much to the genocide of the Indians, the no, no. slavery, blacks, and so on. That seemed to be missing, from the, at least from your discussion. It was, it was missing from the shorter part. It's probably missing to some degree in the longer paper. Uh, it's not missing in the show, and Milch is very explicit about it. He, he takes exactly that point. It's, it's original sin that is embodied in these individuals, but his, the, the whole piece is a critique of the founding of America. That's what I was trying to get with that one quote. Uh, and the founding and refounding, as in the, as in the frontier founding in, in the 1870s. Um, no, he sees that, I mean, the three major char characters that I discuss are a, a sheriff, Seth Bullock, who is a central character, uh, Al Swearingen, who is a saloon owner who controls the town, and, uh, and Hearst, who comes, uh, I mean, these are all historical figures. These are real people that he embroiders his show with, uh, but uh, Hearst made most of his money out of the mine there in Deadwood, uh, his first fortune. This is William Randolph's father, and, and, uh, and, and set that up. So all of these historical characters are there. The whole thing about genocide is there. In fact, it begins with uh, uh, soon after the Custer defeat and so on. All of that's very much in the show. I didn't talk about that much today, but, it, but that concept of original sin drives, the, drives the, the piece. Now, Milch does turn it back into a kind of individual thing. Uh, I mean, Milch is very open about his own uh, biography. Uh, he, he is a, a, an addict of all sorts. He's a junkie. He, he has been a junkie, an alcoholic, a uh, gambling addict, and so on. He talks about that frequently. Uh, and, and so a lot of it is, is written out of that personal aspect as well. But, um, but, the, but the, as a historical piece, it does follow precisely that trajectory. So, and and the, the, the quote of um, uh, the the collateral damage that comes from revenge is, uh, is, is a quote from, oh gosh, it's, it's all gone. But the, uh, 
uh, one of the major chief justices uh, who was writing about uh, the, the theory of the law and how the law develops. Comments, it seems to me, uh, joined to John's comments, that there is, and this also joins to Heather's response, that HBO's kind of aesthetic politics really is most evident, I think, in a very small subset of not just the original programming, but specific original programs. And it seems to me that Milch's programs in particular have this kind of impenetrable, and impenetrable kind of nature to them. And literacy that is so completely beyond the pale of most viewers that it, it really kind of begs the question for me is what exactly is HBO doing? And I think particularly Deadwood, but also John from Cincinnati, wasn't that also a Milch executive producer? Mm -hmm. I've written a little bit on John from Cincinnati, and it just seems to me like it's a, it's a series that typifies exactly some of the problems that John's trying to get at, because here is a show that is so incredibly elliptical allegorical and literally referenced incessantly that most people just kind of give up watching it and say, what the hell is going on? I'm tired of this, right? And so it really does beg the question for me, what is HBO trying to do? Rolling out a full series, uh, I don't know, I think they ran like 13 episodes of John from Cincinnati. Um, and what are they, how are they posi positioning themselves in doing that? What's the industrial context and strategy behind? Other than just kind of give you a backdoor deal to Milch. Yeah, well, I, I, I think John's point is very well taken about the lack of institutional analysis here. That uh, uh, that that if, if you, it, it is a backdoor deal with Milch. I mean, he, he did say, you know, I, I want that uh, that series, and and I'll do Deadwood. The, the Deadwood thing was they came to he he was, they, they wanted to work with him. I think that's one of the things that the that uh, Albrecht and the other people there were doing at that time is really touting their own prestige uh, in in a very calculated way to say these are the shows we want. Now the now the problem, of course, is with with The Wire because it is the least uh, watched of, of the shows. And and once they had the hit with The Sopranos, they kept wanting to do that. So they do depend on this authorial uh, matter and. Um, and Milch, I think, was very unhappy to have to end Deadwood, and John from Cincinnati was was the sop that they threw at him, and he, and he did it. And you're right, uh, nobody knew what it was about, and and then it it too was designed to go on originally, but they they canceled that. So there are, there are moments when HBO will will function just like any other network, um, and particularly with uh, the the kinds of shows that uh, Heather was talking about as well. But I think they, they, they seem to have lost their way at this point, and the, the shows are not getting good ratings, and, and they um, are new subscriptions, and, and they're trying to, uh, to find it again. It's interesting to watch at this point, to watch Showtime move over and pick up things, and to watch the, in, in all of this in the context of what's happening with premium cable, uh, with, uh, with uh, pay cable at the basic level, with uh, American AMC and people like that. To pick up on what Horace said for a second, um, Milch spoke to my class last year, and despite my asking him to focus on Deadwood, he talked about John. And it was quite interesting, because not only did he say that 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 was basically a sop from the network, it was from his perspective almost a fuck you back to the network. Yeah. Because he decided he wanted to take this idea of looking at um, a sort of spiritual reality in, in the context they gave him, which was they told him to do surfing, um, he wanted to sort of push it as hard as he could and to say, what if I put a spiritual entity who spoke in a theological context that was intelligible to everyone and put him in this community of utterly feckless, lost souls, what would they make of him? And it almost, as he described it, sounded like a Zen koan. It was like putting something out there which is supposed to stupefy your mind and bring you to another state of consciousness. The only problem was, was that that's not how television normally works. I mean, <laughs> so in a sense, the show was a spiritual experiment. It was also, you know, commercially a miserable failure. 
And at that point, I'm sure you all know this, he um, mentioned that for his next project, HBO was going to keep him on a very short leash, and he was going back to um, a cop show, a real cop show. I think it's also worth noting that, that Chris Albrecht, you know, that, that David Simon appealed to his ego, and in a sense that ego ended up, you know, hanging him. I mean, yeah. he, the, the person who said yes to all these shows is no longer there because of his own hubris and inability to control his, his, his inner soprano, uh, <laughs> if you will. Uh, because he chokes women, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, while we're talking about institutional analysis of HBO, I was thinking about Six Feet Under and then, you know, being sort of a really interesting example of where religious is, religion was explicit in HBO. And then in the wake of Six Feet Under's success, the failure of Carnival and uh, Big Love would also have very explicit religious references. In fact, I think, and so I'm wondering if you could comment particularly on the failure of Big Love and Carnival, and if you think that there are uh, ways in which religion became part of the story of the failure of those programs in relation to what was going on with the decision. Big, big Love's not a failure. Why would you, why would you, I mean, oh, it's, I, it's going on for its third season. Well, okay, I thought, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about Carnival. <laughs> you can talk about Big Love, too. Okay? Yeah. Uh, Carnival, I thought, was uh, a very expensive, uh, elaborate show that was like peeling an onion and you get to the center and there was nothing there. Uh, and it was um, an exercise in, in uh, stylistic indulgence and, and it cost a lot of money. Um, and that was Ron Moore. And I, you know, we should have asked him about that the other night. So. Big Love, I think, I, I think is is at the moderate level of HBO's success right now. I think they don't get, it's not, I, they suffer from the burden of the Sopranos. I mean, they will never have probably another Soprano. I shouldn't say that, but, but they, would, they would love to have another Sopranos. And Big Love is, is chugging right along and uh, I think uh, uh, has, its, has its following. And, and as The Wire was the lowest in part because it was very, very difficult to follow in many ways. And Deadwood was, I think, probably the, the audience for Westerns is not there very much. So. But I don't know that religion would have anything to do with the Carnival other than the failure of Carnival, other than it was sort of an exotic, exoticized version of various things. Um, uh, Big Love, I think, probably, uh, whatever level of success it has, it's because of its religious content, because of the, the curiosity factor. I think people think of it as, uh, you know, I can, I can now look into uh, polygamy and like the warriors. And it's relatively low budget compared to the other TV yeah. shows, so it's just good kind of sensible shoot programming for them. If it's got mid-level ratings, it's still a fantastic return because mm -hmm. you're not paying the ones who are more than the ones that are shared. And I don't know if they've increased their subscriptions in Utah or not. But, uh, <laughs> 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 One of the features I think that the interviewer also to be added to the institutional analysis came to my mind, and I particularly talking about it really well, is um, the international perspective, because particularly with the premium channels, there are, are the premium channels do a lot of their programming as co-production, particularly with the BBC, because what they saw in terms of the audience, the left paying audience, I mean, these are the people Know, the upper middle class white folk who watch Fast and Peace. But um, the PBS could show you know, other BBC programming because you know, it has a lot of obscenity and a lot of sex in it. You know, white British folk you know, pay for the license. Um, and, you know, I wonder with Big Love, I mean, one of the things that Murphy actually keeping Big Love going is that it wasn't necessarily folks in Utah. That is a big hit in Britain. Mm -hmm. That's where it's it's actually, yeah, yeah, and it's uh, also the shows in Britain are able to garner a large audience because they're actually on three channels. Um, but no, that, 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 that's not a financial problem with maybe cable because they're doing these as either co-productions or deals 
uh, with the BBC or Channel 4. Uh, and I think the big difference between the premium channels on this and say, the network, the networks, because the ratings and advertising revenue driven, are very much dependent on the, one, the, the American audiences. Whereas I think that the premium channels, because they're doing co-productions and um, they're, they, they factor in you know, what they can earn either directly or indirectly through these co-productions in or other street deals um, with a podcast like the BBC. I think that gives them a, a quite a different context. So I think there's perhaps a slightly bigger awareness uh, amongst these uh, basically uh, American media executives that they have an international audience. Yeah, I, I, certainly for, for HBO, and, and they, they do well overseas. The uh, it, it's changed, of course, to, to get into the arcana of the of the institutional stuff since the financial interest and syndication rules were changed, and and the the aftermarket in syndication is, is d diminished now. So that. The networks used to make all their money, uh, really, on, in syndication after they were selling it in other places, and and now that 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 revenue stream is gone. The interesting thing for me is the mid-range in in basic cable, where you have a dual revenue stream between advertisers and subscribers, like FX, uh, TNT, uh, th those kinds of things, where a lot of the most original programming is being done now, even more so than on the premium channels. I want to comment on Lynn's. Uh, question is I've thought about it more about whether the religious nature of the shows caused the failure or that sort of thing. It, it is interesting, I think, given John's comments, that um, if HBO is appealing to a certain kind of elite viewer, um, whether these shows are also appealing to those who are maybe most removed from institutionalized religion. Um, so that sort of the white urban intellectual is probably the least religious in, in, in a formal sense of any subgroup in America at this point. Um, and so it may function as a bit of an alternative church, and an alternative temple. Um, I've seen stats that George Barna has done on, on church attendance and that type of thing. And he sees in the next 25 years that we'll go from maybe 25% or 35% of Americans who get their religion from a traditional church that's moving towards alternative things. And pop culture is one of those alternatives. I mean, he even says, 30% of people will ascribe their religion to pop culture. That's where they will go to get their spiritual um, nourishment, if you will. And so perhaps HBO is, is filling a niche that nobody even is identifying as that. I think that it's important, you know, when we're thinking about audiences and who the audiences are, that not everybody, I'm just speaking out of Sopranos, I guess, but I'm sure it's true of the other shows as well, not everybody encounters these shows because they subscribe to or watch HBO. And the, even the association of the show with HBO isn't something that's necessarily, it's, it's more obvious now than it was. It's interesting now because I watch everything on DVD. I don't, you know, I don't subscribe to these. Uh, I hear about something, then I'll rent it, or if I really like it, then I'll, then I'll buy it. And others do the same. So we're not watching on a week-by-week -week basis. We're renting the stuff, we're buying the stuff, and, wa and gulping it down whole. Um, show after show after show over the Christmas break or over some other period of time and that's a very different experience. What I've noticed recently, is, uh, for example, when I uh, watched Rome, which I also never watched when it was on television, that now it's packaged with this whole promo for other HBO shows. But at least my version of The Sopranos doesn't have that. And so it's only more recently that I realized, oh yes, maybe this is like Maybe one could look at these shows all together and say something about HBO, but it wasn't part of my original experience of it. So, um, and then now also YouTube and other kinds of ways of, of getting at this material, I think makes it difficult to make generalizations about who the audience is and how that relates to a marketing strategy or anything at all on the part of the it makes it difficult to say, well, this show has such low ratings that which obviously yeah, you, people, people aren't watching. Exactly. You can't judge that at all. Yeah. Well. No. yeah. How do you even know, you know, so the impact factor as well to, to judge all that? Well, we've gone from God to marketing. Sarah Benet, why <laughs> should be here to join us? Um, 
I invite you all to have lunch with us, stay in the room, walk, take a walk, but definitely come back at 1.15 for our next panel. Thank you. And thank you all so much.